We're back for another episode focusing on defense with longtime FBS coordinator DJ Elliott. And we've got some, a couple exciting games from this week and two defenses who really excelled and helped get their team to win. We had Oklahoma State beating Texas and UCLA beating Washington. So Coach is going to share a lot of insight into some of the things he's seen here and certainly there's a ton of takeaways. So Coach, it's great to have you back for another week. Glad to be here. So let's let's get into it. Let's start with Oklahoma State. A big game right there for them. They're undefeated right now. They're they're climbing the rankings. In fact, after that game, they ended up at number eight. We'll see what they do as the season continues here. But a big factor in that game was their defense. Exactly. Oklahoma State is playing really good defense right now, and they're getting turnovers. They're getting off the field on third down. They're they're stopping the run. You know they're a top 20 defense, and they've done an excellent job there on developing their players and coaching their schemes. And this uh, Texas game was an exciting game to watch, especially if you were a defensive guy, because it was a tight game and there was a lot of good defensive play. One thing that I noticed from Oklahoma State is they were clouding out of a four-man front to the running back. And, and that's good for snag routes or any free release from the running back. And when they got motion, whether it was fly or whether orbit, what that means is some type of speed motion, they were staying in a cloud look and playing a trap corner, which that is the best adjustment in that coverage. They, they were playing quarters away from the cloud, so it was, it was quarter, quarter halves. But it looked like the cloud was to the running back. And when they got any type of fly or orbit motion, the corner would just stay cloud and play a trap, which means he becomes a fitter inside the wideout. Right. And that is an easy adjustment and is a really good way, in my opinion, to handle any motion adjustment when you're in cloud to one side and quarters to the other. Now, that was creating a three-by-one because of the motion to the cloud side. What's good about that in coverage and the way that Oklahoma State was playing it is the quarter safety now can play the middle of the field. Once the number two or number one goes in motion and there's only one eligible receiver over there to the quarter side, it now turns into three cloud. So with motion, it's three cloud on the run. And that quarter safety can now move to the middle of the field and help on anything uh, in the middle of the field and become a post player. And they were doing an excellent job of that and adjusting that to motion. Now, if they lined up in three by one and the back was to the single receiver side, they were playing a three read concept. Some people call it mini or a stubby Mm -hmm. where the corner is man to man. Meg technique is what I call it. Man everywhere he goes on number one and then the two safeties over two and three to the trip side are reading three and if three goes to the flat then the safety to that side will take him and it turns into basically a halves on those two players but if three goes vertical then both safeties lock on the receivers that they're on top of and it turns into a quarters look it's just read coverage on three a lot of teams run read coverage on one and two where the corner safety read two and if two goes to the flat under five yards then it turns into halves well all this three by one adjustment is this is the same thing but it's on three you know one is meg he's he's man everywhere he goes and then reed is on the number three player between the two safeties if he's vertical then they're in a quarters concept and if he goes to the flat then they're in a halves concept so when they were running this coverage If they motion to it on the fly, not on a cross motion, a cross motion would mean that he goes over and gets set. Some type of fly or orbit motion means that he's on the run. If they motion to it, they just turned it into three cloud. If they lined up in trips, which means you had three guys in vertical alignments, then they checked a mini concept and played cloud to the X side. And I thought they did an excellent job of that. In the red zone, I thought they had a lot of interesting ways of playing their free player. On one snap, they had a five-man pressure man free. And the extra free player, he doubled the slot. He was doubling the, the number two. But the person that he was doubling it with was the corner that was lined up on one. 
So they were in a twin set with only two wide receivers to one side. And the safety that was lined up on number two, he buzzed to number one and cut him, took him on anything underneath. The corner bailed, and the free player in the corner now had a double on the slot. And they ended up running a smash concept, and it was covered really good. You know, whether it had been a smash corner or whether it had been a smash fade, they had somebody on either side of the wide receiver to leverage it. It was really, really an interesting way to play cover one down there and use that free player. Like I said in one of the past episodes, is once you get into the red zone, there's no need to have a post player. Tag him something mm-hmm. to do. Give him something to do if you're going to run a single high concept. So, so, Coach, in the red zone there, and I know you've talked about that before, do you still like to show a free player there, even though you're going to give him a different assignment? Or do you like to bring him down and give him more of a run fit demeanor? If I'm going to give him a different assignment, I will still show a free player or I'll have him show that he's a deep player in some other way. I won't have that player come from low to high. Mm -hmm. What I'll always do is have that player come from high to low. All right. So he may show that he's in halves to the single receiver side, but then he's, he's coming over and he's doubling number three. He may show that he's in quarters and then he's coming over and he's playing Q run responsibility. I'll never bring him from down to deep. I'll always bring him from high to low. If that is my philosophy on it. And the way the Oklahoma State was running it, he was showing that he was a free player, but his responsibility was changing in the red zone on what he was doing. He wasn't playing in the middle of the field. Another example was they were in an over four-man rush, so not a five-man. The last one was a five-man, and they had a, a bracket on the slot with the corner and the free player, and the guy on number two buzzed to number one. But they had a four-man rush, which this allows them to have a whole player. And the free player, the safety, he was doubling number three. So as soon as three went in on an over route, he now took him. And the guy that was covering number three, if he had just come off, he didn't come off. He stayed on him a little bit too long. If he had just come off, he would have got an interception. They, they ran a you know, quick in route, uh, maybe a slant or, or a shallow dig by number two, and, and Texas stuck it in there. It was really a good call if that guy on number three had just come off and covered number two. You know, down in the red zone, when they got unbalanced, they went to a brackets concept Okay, with number two, and they were in a quarters look. And this is a good adjustment because when you get an unbalanced formation from an offense, obviously somebody is ineligible. Mm-hmm. There, there's a, a receiver or a tight end that is ineligible. And this was a two-back formation, and I believe the number two was on the ball. And so that created that number two to be an ineligible receiver. And then if the tight end is off the ball in that scenario, then he is the eligible receiver. And so the guy that was on number two, he rolled up and was outside of that guy. And basically all he's doing is becoming a force defender or playing a bubble of number two. Mm -hmm. It was a great unbalanced adjustment for them. And now the other safety can stay over the top of the tight end and cover him on a vertical route. You know, most X over formations or unbalanced formations, the tight end is covered up and he's on the line. But this one was different and it was in the red zone. And I thought Oklahoma State had an excellent adjustment to it. So, Coach, looking at unbalanced and the ways that you can do it, one is the the X over and you still have the tight end there. Um, Obviously, an extra blocker to the side who is ineligible, do you treat that any differently than if a team went tackle over for you? Is there, um, I don't know, any, any kind of adjustment you prefer one over the other when you see those different scenarios? Definitely. Those are two different types of adjustments. One, you know, with tackle over, you have the same eligibles. With tackle over, you still have the same amount of players eligible. And so your coverage can literally stay the same you just need to move your line 
and bump your backers. Mm -hmm. And then you just adjust to what's called a knock call, which means new offensive center. So once you recognize that it's tackle over, as long as you move your front, your coverage can say the exact same because you have the exact same eligibles. Now, an X over formation or an unbalanced formation, like I said, somebody is ineligible and the eligibles are different now. You can't just necessarily bump your line and play it because the eligibles are different and your count is a little off. Mm -hmm. So a lot of teams like to check it if they see it. And if they check it, then they have certain calls that are play it. Like one call that's a common play it in unbalanced formations is a man free. Because as long as you just line up to your man, all right, the front doesn't have to move. And you're always going to have players in position to fit the run, and you're going to have all the eligibles covered. So any man coverage versus an X over formation does not have to check into anything. Where it can get confusing is, is in a zone coverage. If you have a zone coverage called and they line up in an X over formation, since the eligibles are different, then your zones aren't going to necessarily be able to cover everybody. So a lot of teams will check the call if they were in a zone coverage versus an X over formation, play the call if they're in a man coverage versus an X over formation. And then certain pressures are going to apply too. There's going to be certain pressures that you're going to be able to easily adjust to X over formations. And those will play as well. A tackle over formation doesn't change anything for the defense as long as the front and the linebackers recognize that it's tackle over and just move the front. When you're looking at teams who like to do that, is it a little bit more difficult for you if they move that tight end into essentially what will become an X over and he becomes ineligible? Is, does that present more problems for you on a, on a quick shift than it does if they line up in it? Or is it just the expectation your guys have to see that and adjust? Well, that's why a lot of teams like to check zones because now you're talking about a ton of adjustments that you have to coach in all the different zones, especially on the verticals. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of teams like to check if they're in a, in a zone coverage to one particular zone that they've worked out against all X over formations. And then now they can apply their X over rules to that zone. And one of those rules is just like I talked about. Is there two backs in the backfield? Yes. Okay. Who's eligible? The tight end or the wide out? Because only one of them is going to be eligible. If there's two backs in the backfield. And then within that zone, you can play your rules. All right. Is there one back in the backfield? Okay. There's one back in the backfield. Okay. Now there's going to be three eligibles to one side. All right. Who is eligible between the tight end and the other wideouts? And how are we going to cover them? And with that, too, is, you know, the X-off rules. And Texas was actually getting in more X-off in this game than they were in actually X-over or unbalanced. And so now the defense has to recognize how many guys were lined up on the line to the passing strength, to the three, by, to the three receiver side, and they also have to recognize that X was lined up off the ball. And now they have to get into a uh, check within their zone coverage of what they would apply to that. And again, if they're in a man concept, it's easy. Just go to your man and you'll be in the right place for your run fit and for your coverage. Mm -hmm. But if it's in a zone concept, it can be more difficult. Right, right. Because one of the other things you pointed out that you saw in this game was the use of uh, a flex backer and you know it's uh, flex backers is something I hadn't seen for a long time it used to be like when I played high school football and then even when I started coaching everybody was running some form of an oaky defense and and then all the different things that became in vogue and you know what we call a tight front today was pretty much just double eagle before and you know the flex backers the defense certain things so it's neat to see some of these things come back into play as as uh the, the pendulum swings back and forth between the offense and the defense. You're exactly right. And let me just say this. Oklahoma State is very multiple on defense. 
they run a lot of different schemes and a lot of different fronts, and they give you a lot of different looks. And they've done an excellent job of not only running a lot of schemes, but executing a lot of schemes. And as you know, as a coach, that's the most difficult thing. Mm -hmm. It's not how many schemes we know. I mean, a lot of us know a lot of schemes. It's how many schemes can we execute? And that, to me, is a testament to their good coaching and their good teaching. That is the key to being multiple. If you want to be multiple, it's not how well you know the scheme. It's how easily you can teach the scheme. And what is your plan to teach a scheme? And what are the likes and as is between different schemes that you can apply to players and their techniques so that they can execute it as a coordinator. That's where you really have to rely on your assistant coaches and your assistant coaches have to be excellent teachers. If you want to run multiple schemes, your assistant coaches need to be excellent teachers. It's easy for an assistant coach to coach a few schemes and not have to work on how good a teacher is and not to work on how organized his drill plan is. But when an assistant coach is very, very valuable is when he can teach multiple schemes to his position in a very organized manner and be able to drill it in practice and then allow the entire defense to be multiple because of the hard work that he did. And I see that in Oklahoma State. Uh, the flex defense that you're talking about was an oaky front, so it was two fives and a zero, and an inside backer at the heels of the defense alignment. Now, the two ends are playing read techniques. That means depending on which way the tackles block determines if they're playing a C gap or if they're playing a B gap. If the tackle blocks at them, they come under and play the B gap. If the tackle blocks away from them, they step shuffle and play the C gap. The flex backer is doing the same thing off the guard that he's lined over the top of. If the guard blocks at, out, he plays an A gap. And if the guard blocks down, he plays a B gap. The second element of the flex backer is, though, if the guard pulls. And if that guard pulls, then he gets over the top. The nose is playing a lag technique, which means he plays the back side of the zone off the center. The center zones to the right, he plays the left. Center zones to the left, he plays the right. And he fights into any double teams. So wherever the double team is off the gap scheme, he fights into it. They were doing this out of man free. And what I liked about it is – they were able to fit the run off their read techniques with their uh, inside backer in their D line, but they were also able to banjo the back, which means whichever linebacker has the back, then depends on which way that line, that running back goes. And then that linebacker takes the back. And then the other player becomes, becomes the whole player. If it were a pass, the question is, what do you do with the flex backer? And if you're playing an athletic quarterback, this is a good, a good way to get a double on the quarterback because that flex backer can now become a spy on that quarterback along with whichever linebacker is not covering the running back. I like to assign in man-free coverage a responsibility – to the free underneath player. So in a four-man man-free coverage, you're going to have your middle-of-the-field player who's free, and you're also going to have a low player that's free. And that player can be in a banjo with the back, or and that's with another linebacker, or a certain linebacker can be assigned to cover the back no matter where he goes, and that linebacker is free no matter what. I like to assign that free player what to do once he becomes free. He can become a whole player, which to me is five yards deep, don't back up, key the quarterback, break on the ball. He can become a cut player, which means as soon as the ball snapped and he reads pass, 
do not back up and cut your eyes to whichever way that you've coached him that week to cut first. And if you get a shallow, cut it. If you don't get a shallow, cut your eyes to the other side. Okay. And if you get a shallow from that side, cut it. And what that will allow is a second level free player because the DB, once he sees that his man is cut, will come off. And now he'll play a hole or a rat concept from a, from a second level. Or you can assign that free player to be a spy, which means as soon as pass shows, don't back up, spy the quarterback. And as the pass develops, work to get to the heel line of the defensive line. And they were running that scheme out of flex. And I think they had success in the run and the pass for those reasons. Coach, when you're looking at utilizing that that whole player in as you mentioned three different ways there are you preparing just one of those ways for a game plan do you look at multiple ways and what tells him in a call that has that he has that responsibility so you can tag it you can put it in a call or you can game plan it there, there's three different ways that you could do it you know if you wanted to run multiple ways in a game then then you're going to want to tag it right if there's a certain way that you want to play it versus a certain look, then you're basically going to check it. And then if there's one way you want to play it the whole game, then each call, then it's in the call that he knows, hey, I got to play this call this way and I got to play that call that way. So you have the option with that extra player for three different ways to play it in one game, a way that you could check it, or each call determines a different way to play it. I personally, okay, I personally like to game plan it and for whatever opponent I'm playing will determine how I'm going to play it that week. So mine will usually change based on the week and who I'm playing. Mm -hmm. If I'm playing Russell Wilson, odds are I'm going to have that guy as a spied player the entire week. Right. He's not going to, he's not going to be cutting unders and he's not going to be playing the hole. Right. If I'm playing a air raid mess team, odds are that guy's going to be cutting crosser. If I have a very athletic wide out that I'm worried about, you know, the linebacker taking over as a crosser, but I still want to get an extra window in there, I'm going to play him as a whole. And so depending on who the opponent is can determine how you play that guy. But you also have the ability to change it within the game or, or tag it within a call. Coach, we had a, a critical situation in the game where uh, you saw that Oklahoma State was playing an eight-man drop and doing something interesting there to, to really make it tough in that situation for them to pick up the first down. It was a critical down. It was the second-to-last series for, for Texas. It was fourth and three. And they were backed up and it was a one score game at this time. And Oklahoma state lined up in a three man front and they showed a zero pressure and they bailed out to an eight man drop Tampa two, which was an excellent call. The quarterback recognized he had nowhere to throw the ball. He scrambled and Oklahoma state tackled him short of the sticks. But what's critical when you run this call on third down is how you alert or how you coach your players underneath on the depth of their drop. Oklahoma State did an excellent job of all the underneath players did not drop deeper than three yards. So any route that was thrown at the sticks was covered. There was no, you know, top down, too much depth, sticking it in there for a first down. And when the quarterback went to scramble, the underneath players had their feet in the ground at three yards. So he wasn't able to get to the sticks because of the depth of their drop. They were able to tackle him short of the sticks. And they did an excellent job of that. You know, when you run to Tampa – and this was an eight-man drop to Tampa. Eight-man drop and or 
halves and or an eight-man drop to Tampa, which is the combination of both. That can be run to stop anything deep because you're three deep and you're playing halves, so you're collisioning the wideouts. And so if it's being run to stop something deep, then the underneath droppers have to drop okay, at an angle towards the depth of the sticks and then get their eyes back to the quarterback and be ready to tackle a check down or anything underneath. If they don't get enough depth, they can get beat on a deep dig or they could get beat on a deep curl route or the corner could get beat on a deep out route. So they have to understand when they're calling it because it's third and extra long or third and long, where is the depth of their drop? Now, the other way or the other reason that you would run this type of coverage is for a fourth or a third in medium because of how many underneath droppers you have, right? right? The more underneath droppers you have, the more you're going to take away quick game. Well, Oklahoma State showed zero. So they made the quarterback think it was a zero pressure. He's looking to throw hot or side adjust and then bailed to an eight-man drop to Tampa. But their players were coached uh, very well, and they did not drop deeper than three. And you have to understand the situation that you're calling this defense in and where the depth of the underneath droppers need to drop in order to be able to execute it. From uh, the standpoint of installing and practicing that, right, any really any kind of, of situation like that where you need to know where the sticks are, you need to know where the depth of that drop is, uh, and, it, and it could vary, right? That could be a, a three, a four, or five yard, a little bit longer. What's the best way to coach your guys up to, to accomplish that and to be effective? Because as you said, the other thing that was big to that was when he scrambled, they could all converge on that as well. One way that some defenses do it is before they signal in the call, which basically is alerting them that it's third down or fourth down, they give a stick signal. All right. And so that is telling the underneath dropper, hey, look at the sticks and play them. So one way that the defenses do it is they, they, they signal a sticks call in before they call the call. But I've also known other defensive coordinators that actually just give them a, a separate name so that the underneath droppers know the angle that they're dropping. They're either getting depth before width or they're getting width before depth mm -hmm. in their drop. And that's another good way to do it. You know, you may call one uh, Tampa and you may call the other one Miami. And that way that they know that, hey, one is being run for third and long and one is being run for third and medium. A huge stop there at the end of the game. And just a, a great game overall. Another exciting game to watch. Uh, a lot of adjustments from both sides throughout the game and, and guys really coaching their tails off. Uh, the other game, which was an interesting one on the West Coast, we had UCLA and, and Washington. And UCLA, I think, is, is one they're not right now in, in the rankings. But, you know, talking to Noel Mazzoni early in the season, he really liked what those guys were doing on offense. And he thought overall they could be a pretty good team. So I think, you know, a lot, lot to see what's going to happen here with UCLA. But some great things that you saw on the defensive side of the ball. Yes, I thought UCLA played good defense. They held Washington to 14 points, and they had good schemes. They were playing hard. They were playing good fundamentals. One thing that I noticed is just like we talked about against Georgia, there were multiple line stems. So the line was showing a three-man front and stemming to a four-man front, or vice versa, or walking a backer up. And, and walking him out. So they were doing what they could to confuse the offense with their multiple line stems. And then they were also running some line stunts. And, and, and mainly it was a, it was like a, um, a, a nose first tackle second stunt uh, to stop the run. And with that, they were running quarter, quarter halves coverage, but it was an inverted halves. And I think that is a good disguise for a defense. So you can show a two shell, right? And you can have the corner in halves play the play the flat and collision one. 
or you can show a inverted half look and make it look like a single high slash um, a zero and have the safety that comes down to that side buzz the flat and become the flat player. And UCLA was doing that and was executing it really well. That also puts you in position to drop that safety down and blitz him off the edge because now that guy can come down. He can cover number two. He can come down. He could buzz the flat and play underneath the one, or he could come down and he could come off the edge. And it's the same look, but three different things that he's doing to the offense. One thing that I like about doing that too, is it allows the corner okay, to, to play off and look like he has given the offense a quick hitch or a quick out on the number one receiver. But in reality, the safety that's down to that side is going to buzz underneath that. Mm -hmm. So it takes away um, some of the gift throws from the offense based on the look that you give them. Now that quarterback is going to think twice before he throws a gift throw over there because he's not sure if that safety is going to buzz out there underneath number one or not. With that, you know, anytime you're going to run a a quarters or a quarter, quarter halves coverage, and you're going to try to play plus one defense for quarterback runs and or for RPOs, you need to push the run outside. You need to push the run for width. And we talked about that with what Texas A&M is doing with their line stunts. And UCLA was doing some of that too. But with that, the linebacker run fits are different. You know, you can, you can gap linebackers out, which they're a gap responsibility versus zone schemes and they play it no matter what. Or when you're going to do this, you're going to add extra players to the run, but you're also not going to want to put them in run pass conflict. Then the inside linebackers have to play what's called a fallback fit which means they play behind the zone. Whichever way the zone goes, they play behind it. And then the extra fit player is a second-level player, whether it's a nickel, whether it's a corner, or whether it's a safety, to the front side of the zone in the C or D gap. So he's able to, to play it from depth or width because he's only going to show up if the ball bounces. But that is a critical technique by the inside linebackers if you're going to play that structure in the run game. And UCLA was doing that. They were doing a good job. If any time they got into this type of structure, their inside linebackers fell back and played behind the zone, which basically means they play a gap behind the zone and whatever the defensive line's doing, whether it's just an over front or a stun up front. You know, another thing they were doing is they were getting into a three-man rush, man-free, just like Oklahoma State. And they ended up getting two guys on the quarterback, like I talked about, because one of the extra linebackers is a total spy. He's a spy, okay, no matter what. And then the other two backers are in a banjo off the back. The backer that becomes the whole player, depending on which way the back goes, now you have a double on the quarterback on a spy. And sometimes you're going to need that. There's certain quarterbacks that are excellent scramblers that one guy cannot tackle them. And so you're going to have to get a double on that guy if he chooses to scramble. And this is a way to do that. And UCLA was doing that, and I thought it was really good. You know, they ran ran a lot of zero coverage, especially on third down. But – to complement that, when they were in their quarters looks, they were showing a lot of zero. So they may have run zero, but it wasn't the only time the quarterback saw zero. You know, in quarters and zero coverage, they marry. So, you know, you any time that you got four guys covering four verticals, that also can give you the same look of quarters, right? So you want to make sure that sometimes when you line up in quarters that you show zero – just so that the quarterback doesn't know, hey, this is definitely zero, and I know where I'm going with the ball. And they did a good job of that. I also saw a 
corner blitz from the boundary, but quarters to the field. When you run this call, you're playing zone to one side, quarters to the field, and you're playing man to the other side. And what's critical about a, a pressure when you do this is there has to be a player that takes an underneath route from the man side to the zone side. So a player's technique has to be labeled that he's going to take anything back underneath from the man side to the zone side. And so it's, it's different than just regular quarters because one side is man. Mm -hmm. So one of those underneath players needs to know he's going to play his zone coverage, but he's also going to bring back any shallow route that goes from the man side to the zone side. So coach, the, the uh, corner blitz is certainly something that can hurt an offense. That guy is, you know, he's, he's not in the scheme. Um, I mean, your back maybe would, would be checking for a blitz off the edge on a pass, uh, but it's something that can hurt you. Now, from the same standpoint, we've had that uh, teams trying to do that against us and our quarterback seeing it and really hurting the defense because it wasn't timed up with that guy getting over the top or because of his athletic ability, you know, his alignment didn't help him. So the, the best ways to, to make that corner blitz work without – um, without giving away too much to, to show it's coming? I think the best way to make that corner blitz work without giving it away is, one, you have to, you have to work in halves to that side because that halve structure is the same look that it's going to look when you run corner blitz, right? But another coaching point is have the corner instead of with his eyes inside because a lot of wide receivers – will hurt the quarterback as soon as the corner right. is pressed with his eyes inside. Okay. Have the corner look at the wide out and not run the blitz until his movement. And that can help on some of the disguise. So again, it, it, you know, corner blitz has to look like cloud. Anytime you bring the corner and the safety is going to replace and cover him man to man, you've got to mix in cloud. And so when you run some cloud, you need to show, show corner blitz. So you get into some cloud. Now you may act like that corner got too early and he stands and shows that he's running corner blitz. You know, the, the, the um, receiver alerts the quarterback. He tries to throw it out there. Then the corner bails out and plays the half. Right. So those two have to marry. They have to marry. Now the inverted halves, like I talked about earlier, that's an example of instead of it being corner blitz, now it's safety blitz. And the safety blitz and the inverted halves have to marry. If you're going to drop down there and bring that safety off the edge, okay, into a single receiver side especially, and have that corner covering number one, then you have to have the same look where that safety drops down there and can fake like he's blitzing and not blitz and play the flat. Those are some good game planning thoughts right there, definitely. And, yeah, we, we would do exactly that. I mean, work our receivers on uh, giving a call to the quarterback when they see that guy who's, who's blitzing, you know. And I, I, So when you mix it up like that, you, you kind of take that away from them. So real good coaching points there. Well, Coach, uh, a lot of information here packed into this short podcast. Some great ideas, I think, that you've pointed out that are successful for these teams and – uh, great job digging into why some of these work and how to make them work with your own team. So I'm looking forward to another great weekend of games and getting back next week and talking more defense. Same here. Thanks for having me.